tired of dealing with your autoimmune hair loss known as alopecia areata? Alopecia areata is a common hair loss disorder, it is non-scarring by nature and can affect 1% of the population. It can be quite debilitating and disfiguring as patches of hair or hair loss develop on the scalp and other parts of the body. What if we tell you that alopecia areata now has newer breakthrough medications that can target the immune system pathway and reduce the severity of such symptoms? If you're interested in finding more about alopecia areata as well as the newer class of medications used to target alopecia areata, follow us in the video below and learn more. Alopecia areata is also commonly known as patch baldness and can affect any individual of any age group and has no gender or ethnic predilection. It can happen in young children as well as elderly individuals and can develop at any time point in your life. Typically, there might be a trigger that will allow this immune system pathway to unravel. This can come from severe stress, certain vaccinations or immunizations, illnesses can destabilize the immune system and cause the alopecia areata to present for its very first time. So alopecia areata is an autoimmune form of hair loss disorder localized mainly to hair bearing skin and as such can only affect hair bearing skin type from the scalp, eyelashes, eyebrows, face and body hair doesn't have any associated underlying organ dysfunction such as affecting your kidney, lungs or your liver but can be very cosmetically disfiguring and debilitating especially socially. There are various types of alopecia areata and a way of looking at it would be the body side involvement. Most individuals typically present with scalp involvement where they develop one or multiple patches on the scalp, hair bearing skin, or it can also affect other areas of the body such as the beard hair in male patients, the limbs where there is hair on the body as well, and even the eyebrows and eyelashes. In individuals with very severe forms of alopecia areata affecting the entire scalp, we would then classify this as alopecia totalis. In individuals where the hair loss is involving extensive areas of the body, including the body hair and facial hair on top of the scalp hair, we would classify this as alopecia universalis. There are also certain specific patterns such as ophiasis pattern or Mary Antoinette syndrome which are just presentations and have different forms of prognosis based on its location. Now alopecia areata is classified as a non-scarring form of hair loss. So in alopecia, we typically like to categorize scarring and non-scarring forms. In non-scarring forms, it means basically that the hair follicles are still intact and can regrow when the disease condition is in remission. So in alopecia areata, sometimes in very limited localized patches, patients might experience spontaneous regrowth after a number of months, even without seeking treatment. However, it is important to note that alopecia areata if left untreated and is constantly under relapse, can give rise to constant depletion of hair follicles and their life cycles and subsequently give rise to a chronic status where alopecia areata is continuing in the background. It can also give rise to a depletion of hair follicle cycles which means that after episodes and repeated bouts of alopecia areata, you can then develop full regrowth but the hair follicles might be permanently more thin or weaker than it was before. We see this commonly when patients suffer from very severe AA, AA totalis for example, or AA that is very chronic and constant over a year or two years. And even when they achieve remission after one to two years, you'll find that the overall density is reduced because the quality of the hair follicles has changed. This is because the life cycle of each follicle is transacted much earlier on due to the repeated bouts of inflammation and hair fall and repeated stimulation of new hair cycles. This then prematurely ages the hair follicle and gives rise to a thinning process that happens at a much younger age. Alopecia areata can be managed in a number of ways and first should be determined based on preference, age as well as severity. Now in younger individuals such as children, they may not tolerate certain stronger medications or even injection type of treatments and hence topicals may be the best option. Topicals such as topical steroids can be utilized over the patches of hair loss to try to reduce the inflammatory response and shut down the autoimmune pathway, allowing hair follicles to re-enter the growth cycle. This has limited effects sometimes in more severe cases and typically then the next line option would be intralesional steroid injections. 
This is a very commonly employed technique and can be done once a month to the localized patches and the border or rim around each patch where the advancement border is. Other than intralesional steroid injections, some people may choose to employ topical immunotherapy or what we call DCP applications. This can be done weekly with incremental concentrations, but the side effects include that of redness, itch and irritation and may not be suitable for everybody, including those who have a background history of sensitive skin type or eczema. Then, the next available option would be that of oral systemic therapy for more moderate to severe cases or very aggressive cases of alopecia areata. The most common option employed would be that of oral prednisolone given for a moderate duration. Now, in a very severe flare-up of alopecia areata, it is worthwhile to consider or contemplate using systemic oral prednisolone for a period of 4 to 8 weeks to try to decrease the autoimmune response and allow the hair follicles to stabilize. When we utilize oral prednisolone in this fashion, it is typically given at a higher dose at the beginning and tapered down towards the end of 4 to 8 weeks. However, there are some patients that do not do well with oral steroid therapy and tend to relapse and basically go through worsening of symptoms once the steroid dose is reduced. And we come across patients as such where four to six weeks into therapy, they also develop other moderate side effects such as water retention and weight gain and may not be suitable to continue oral steroid therapy. As such then, if we do need to utilize longer term medications, we may then consider utilizing other immunosuppressive medications that are safer in the mid to longer term. Traditionally, we would consider things such as cyclosporine, for example, or even methotrexate to reduce the autoimmune response and to reduce the immune system from triggering the hair follicle to be disrupted. However, these medications are older but have certain host of side effects to consider and contemplate, such as in the management of eczema as well. Fast forward to today, we now have the exciting development of genus kinase inhibitors that can be safely utilized for the treatment of alopecia areata that is severe or more refractory to traditional treatment and has promising good results while on jet inhibitor therapy. The side effect profile is much more well tolerated in the moderate to long term use as it is more targeted to specific small molecules that trigger the inflammatory pathway. Like all drugs, there are of course side effects to consider even though it is much more targeted and a narrow spectrum immunomodulator. Certain common side effects include that nausea, headache, rashes. Other more severe side effects to consider include reactivation of latent TB. Hence, it is important to screen for any latent TB before commencing paracetinib treatment. Other more severe side effects include a slight increased risk in blood clotting especially if there's a family history of hypercoagulable disorders. Alopecia areata can be a very distressing condition depending on the severity as well as age of onset. Especially when it's chronic and relapsing, alopecia areata can be really uh, debilitating and defeating for many individuals. Although it doesn't involve the body systemically, such as any organ dysfunction, it can be socially distressing, especially when patients are of a younger age group. Now, I hope that this video has been informative and helpful for those of you who may be suffering from this condition and are looking for the updates and advancements in the management of alopecia areata. As we know that alopecia areata is an autoimmune condition, even after achieving remission, there is still a chance of relapse many years later. And hence, I would still state that there is still no complete cure for alopecia areata, although medical advancements have made it possible for us to much better manage more severe variants of alopecia areata. If you like this video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and follow us on our YouTube channel for more up-to-date content on dermatological conditions and how to best manage them.